Welcome to the Source of Commercial Real Estate, where we talk to the experts in non-residential commercial real estate so you can grow your business, find a competitive advantage, and use real estate to live the life that you want. I am your host, Jonathan Hayek, and today I am talking with Taylor Lote of NT Capital. Taylor, thank you so much for joining me today. I am sincerely looking forward to this conversation. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. It's awesome to speak with you again since we met in Salt Lake City earlier this year and uh, just really excited to reconnect and connect with your audience as well. Perfect. Taylor, why don't we get started by you telling us about your background, how you got started in real estate and what your work looks like today? Yeah, absolutely. So I got started in real estate because honestly, I got frustrated with what I was getting back out of my investments in Wall Street's products, if you will. I've always been quite good with my personal finances from the second I started making a little bit of big boy money. I had a lot left over to invest, and I started with a strategy promoted by one of these books behind me here, The Intelligent Investor, talking about value investing in publicly traded securities. So I did that for a few years, and it was going quite well from an appreciation, market appreciation standpoint, right? I was picking the right things, investing in the right things, but not making any cash flow. And I was doing the math moving forward, seeing, man, this isn't going to take me where I want to get financially. Happened to pick up one of the other books here behind me, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. I was listening to real estate podcasts at the time. Everybody talking about this book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. So I said, oh, whatever, I'll check it out. And man, he just gave me uh, the the burning desire to become a real estate cash flow investor. So that set me on the track to get into multifamily investing around the 2016 timeframe, got started in the space. And you know, today, focusing on investing in multifamily and self-storage around the country, working with operators and passive investors to raise capital, do some 1031 deals as well and really just continue to build wealth with real estate. Great. Really interesting background. Um, tell me a little bit more about NT Capital. Um, what is your business model? Are you a general partner? Are you a limited partner? Are you a capital raiser? Tell me how you're spending your time now. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I do invest in our deals as a limited partner, uh, but our role in the deal is really raising investor capital. And there are so many people out there doing that today that are frankly just completely breaking securities laws. And <laughs> I years ago had set my sights on being someone who raises capital in syndications. I had been a general partner on a couple of deals, you know, doing asset management, all the other things, but really decided that I wanted to get out of everything but working with the investors, finding the deals, finding the operators, that's all great. But I really wanted to focus on the capital raising side of things. And once you kind of start to dig into that, you learn pretty quickly that it's difficult to do that in a legal sense. There are a lot of people out there trying to use what they perceive to be loopholes in the rules. And But really, if you sit down and talk with a securities attorney, they're going to tell you that any look at this by the SEC with this co-GP model where people are kind of just trying to hide that they're acting as unlicensed broker dealers, that'll just fall apart under any degree of legal scrutiny if you get looked at by the eye of, of the SEC. So that never sat well with me. I wanted to do that side of the business. Um, and I finally found the opportunity to get licensed with a broker dealer so that I'd be able to focus on raising investor capital and importantly, be able to sleep at night because to me, you know, legal compliance and doing the right thing are like step one to doing any business. And uh, so that, that was very important, getting licensed, everything like that, and allowed us to scale, have a lot more deal flow. And while there are restrictions, if you will, when you get licensed as to what you can do, what you can say about deals, how you can work with investors, things along those lines, on the working with operators side of things, when you're speaking with operators who are reputable, who want to do the right thing, who want to grow their business, the second that they find out that you can legally raise capital for them, kind of the floodgates open. There's a lot of turning operators down because they either don't 
you know, fit our model. They're not doing the types of deals we want to do, or they don't have the experience level that we look for. You know, to me, checking those legal boxes, even though it honestly added a couple of years to my growth and journey to make that happen, has been totally worth it and has enabled us to to grow. And again, you know, sleep at night. It's very, very important to me. I want to talk more about what seems to be sort of a competitive advantage for you of becoming a licensed broker dealer. I have to plead a little bit of ignorance on this one. I have heard the term thrown out and I ha I've talked with other capital raisers and they've thrown the term out. I don't know that I've actually interviewed a licensed broker dealer. So can you talk about um, what a licensed broker dealer is and what it took to get that designation? Sure. First, let's clarify some terms. So there's the broker dealer, which is the organization, if you will, that handles the securities transaction. And then there's the broker dealer rep, which is what I am, that kind of hangs our license under the broker dealer. And we are supervised by the broker dealer and operate again under their supervision. Is it is it almost like a real estate agent operating under a larger brokerage? Is it that kind of idea? Yes and no. Um, okay. I would say it's, you know, you're still have, you still have the broker title, but for us, we don't just go out there and do any deal whatsoever. We do a lot of front end due diligence on the operators, a lot of background checks, checking out their properties, going to their offices. We're not just going to the MLS, if you will, of real estate syndications and, you know, just willy nilly doing whatever deal. There's a lot more of that tailoring on the front end, on the operations and deal side. And on, then on the investor side, we have a lot of requirements put in place by FINRA to understand or, or work with our investors and evaluate them and act in their best interest. And I don't want to get too deep into talking about these specific regulations because this is why we have compliance people to check all those boxes and I just do what they tell me to do. There are a lot of requirements that FINRA puts in place. That's the first time we've mentioned their name. Um, there are two kind of bodies in this space. There's the SEC, which folks are certainly familiar with in this space. We've mentioned them. And Securities and Exchange Commission, right? If you want to be a broker dealer and have that license, that is regulated by FINRA. And in our space, once you get that license, you're under the uh, supervision, if you will, or under the control regulation, what have you, of both the SEC and FINRA. So there's the SEC's rules, and then there's these the FINRA rules, which add more requirements in what we can and cannot do and say when it comes to a you know securities transaction. So it's really in the interest of protecting the investors as much as possible and putting requirements on us to you know, do a lot of things on the front end and the back end to work to protect them. Now that doesn't, we don't, uh, there's still risk in the investments, of course, you know, it's nothing like, like that. We can't insure the investment or anything along those lines. I don't want to get ahead of that there, but from, uh, you know, that due diligence on the front end, making sure the, the sponsors are not a, a Ponzi scheme, for example, to the best of our abilities or on the investor side of things in in working to protect them and do our best to understand their situation if you had somebody come to you that was had $25,000 to their name well that's not somebody who's qualified to invest in a syndication but a syndicator might be tempted to go in toward that route with us there's an additional layer of that evaluation of the investor by you know compliance and everything to make sure that their risk tolerance is in line with a private placement security, which is a an illiquid investment. You can't get out of it, or you almost certainly can't get out of it once you're invested. There are some ways you can get out in syndications, but you should consider it that you can't get out once you're in until the deal sells. You know, there's risk to the investment, everything along those lines. And while we don't make investment recommendations to our investors, we do have to act in their interest and, you know, be objective and make sure we're checking those boxes, if you will, before we bring them into an investment or share something like that with them. 
Great. Thanks for clarifying uh, kind of the difference between a broker dealer and not a broker dealer. There, I mean, you said it earlier, there are a ton of people uh, attempting to raise capital right now. Um, it seems to me that this strategy of being a capital raiser and then going in on the LP side, you know, getting a bunch of your friends and family together and going in on a deal and um, you being at you as the capital raiser, it seems like it's becoming more popular, uh, both from your perspective and also from the operator perspective in using people like you to raise money. Why does it seem like this strategy um, has become more popular in the last several years? Yeah, it's a great question. So from my perspective, I see it as there was a pretty significant surge of that activity pre-COVID up until I want to say it was mid 2019, if I remember right. I the way I understand it is the SEC sent some folks some letters that said, "Hey, we're going to take a look at what you're doing." Who had been kind of engaging in that activity? The word got around, and that did s seemingly reduce some of this activity out there going on. It's certainly still happening, but that initial surge of it seems to have kind of subsided and. Generally, folks are more interested in avoiding that, if you will. Right now, what I see for folks that want to raise capital for syndications, uh, there's obviously the licensed broker dealer route, which folks are willing to go. There's, a, again, a lot more compliance to it and complexity and costs and everything like that for, for our side. And then there's the fund of funds route, which has gained in popularity as well. Um, there are certainly plenty of regulations on that side that personally I wouldn't be able to speak to because I've never run a fund of funds, but that's gained in popularity as, again, word got around about the SEC taking a look into these things, folks generally wanting to be more careful, and the growth of tech tools and companies that will enable you to put together your own fund of funds so that you can raise capital and place it in syndication. So that's I see it as really the development of the market in this space in general, you know, water kind of finding its level and folks who are more serious about building a sustainable business in the long term in this space, looking for legal solutions to participate in the syndication market in this way. Now there is this unlicensed activity out there going on. Certainly nothing that I can do about it. My goal is just to, you know, keep my nose clean. So Taylor, you mentioned that you are not a fund of funds model. So does that mean that you are raising for individual deals? And when somebody invests with you, they know exactly which deal and which operator they're investing with? Yes. Yeah, so our investors go straight into the security that's offered by the syndicator. We don't generate the security or offer the security. The security is offered by the syndicator that we're working with. So we're not like personally, I never receive or touch investor capital. It goes straight to the syndicator. I don't want to receive it or touch it, which is great for me. That reduces complexity and everything like that. We don't have any of that information. So that adds a, that's convenience for the investor in the syndicator. It's not an additional like level of fees that, you know, a fund of funds, you have an additional level of fees there and it can mm -hmm. be tough to, make work. Now, the types of deals that we do are single asset, one-off syndications, if you will, and funds. Generally, it's just like kind of a mix of, of different deals that we do. I found that in my experience, my investors are probably 90% most interested in the more one-off deals where the asset is identified. It has a uh, defined projected, you know, close date. This is when the windows open. We're expecting to close on X, X, Y date. This is what we're buying. Here's what the deal looks like as opposed to a say fund that has, uh, maybe going to target a certain number of properties in certain States and areas. And this is what we're looking for, but we don't have the assets identified because that's just the nature of, of a fund, a more open-ended activity. I think in my experience, investors are more interested in the first one where they have a pretty specific idea of what they're investing in. That could be just my investor profile, the folks who I'm connected with that invest with me, what they're interested in. But I get that feeling in general that that's what people are more interested in anyway.
I want to probe into your specific model a little bit because it's a little bit different than some of the other capital raisers that I've talked with. Um, some other capital raisers, what they do is they set up a separate LLC and their investors uh, do, in fact, uh, give them the money and mm -hmm. this capital raiser, you know, has a big pot. They say, you know, say a million dollars. And then that one LLC takes that million dollars, uh, to the operator and they invest a million dollars as a whole. And they say, when you bring that larger chunk of money, you can negotiate better term, better, better terms, uh, better returns for you and your investors. But you, on the other hand, you said that you don't even touch the money. And so uh, your investors go straight to the operator. So I guess my, my, the, the best question that I can come up with is how are you earning money then if you are not like what's in it for you? Why would, why would the investor go through you or interact with you and not go straight to the operator? Can you flesh that out a little bit for me? Sure. So every deal. So the, the first model that you lined out, that would be the fund of funds model where folks are okay. putting together their own fund or, or entity, raising capital, and then placing that capital in somebody's deal. They're bringing a larger check. So they're getting a more preferable GPLP split. And the person that put that fund together is taking the difference essentially mm -hmm. that they're getting by. And that's, you know, it's fine. It's, I don't think there's any problem with that. As long as you're checking all your boxes, if you're raising that fund, that LLC, and you're putting capital into it, you are offering a security. So there is an additional layer of, you know, SEC disclosures, whether it's a 506B or 506C that you have to offer. So that's not something that you can just go, you know, go on to uh, legal zoom, start an LLC, open a bank account and start raising money. No, you have, you're still offering a security <laughs> there. There's still securities laws to be involved with on our side. So again, every deal has a GPLP split. The model previously when folks were doing this kind of KG co GP thing is that the GP side would be divided amongst, uh, different activities in the role, whether that was uh, asset management or the acquisitions or, um, you know, underwriting or broker, whatever, all the different activities. And one of those activities was, and is capital raising, and that can be allocated, you know, pro rata, at least when you're doing it in a, in a legal sense. So for us, we don't add an additional layer of fees. Our payment comes and our compensation comes from the operator as a cut of the general partnership that's already there. So. I believe the incentive for our investors is that, again, we don't add that additional layer of fees. We are compensated by the GP. Savvy general partners and operators who have been in the business for a while, I believe, and I've seen, see the advantage of having multiple options and a diverse uh, set of ways to raise capital. So that's why they're interested in working with outside people who can help them bring money in, in a legal sense. Um, for our investors perspective, you know, we do vet the deals, vet the operators, invest in the deals ourselves as well. So I think that it adds an additional layer of comfort and confidence in, in the deals, you know, um, again, we don't make any guarantees, right? The security is offered by the operator. There's no investments still carry risk, all the important disclosures, PPMs, read your operating agreement and make sure you understand it, everything, um, like that. But in my opinion, the not adding additional you know, layer of complexity and fees in this way that the fund of funds model does is an incentive. And then also doing that, you know, participating in the deal and doing that additional layer of due diligence. I think those are all, um, good advantages for investors. It's my opinion. So to clarify, you are part of the general partnership on the deals in which you're raising money for non-voting members. So we're not taking control, right? We're, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. And you can do that because you're a broker dealer. Ordinarily, you cannot be part of the GP only, only because your role is raising money. Can't uh, be but, compensated for raising capital without a license, basically. Okay. But you do have a license. And so I that's do. why yeah. you're, you're able to operate in that way. That's okay. right. Um, there are so many different ways to raise capital. Um, so yeah, I hope listeners that are new to the space or, you know, still learning alongside with me, um, that this was super helpful, uh, for them, uh, cause it's sometimes, uh, the, 
passive investing world can be opaque about fees. Who's who's making money? How are they making money? Um, where? How much are fees? Where are the fees coming from? Um, so thank you so much for clarifying that. Um, talk to me about the current dynamic between yourself as a capital raiser and deal sponsors um, or operators. Are our sponsors and operators are they desperate for money right now? Are they are you, are they knocking down your door trying to get you to raise capital for them, um, or are you having to hit up operators to try to raise capital for them? Is it uh, somewhere in the middle, which is where most things lie? Can you tell me about the current dynamic between yourself and operators? Uh, somewhere in the middle is probably a good way to put it. I mean, mm -hmm. so. Uh, being a podcast host myself, who I speak with a lot of folks in the real estate space generally, including a lot of, of sponsors, when it comes up in a conversation prior to our recording or afterward, mention, talking about my business model and everything, a lot of operators do express interest in working with us. So there's there's quite a lot of, of turning folks away, honestly. Um, and, that, you know, it just kind of is what it is, you know. Um, so there's a good bit of that, whether they're already, they're doing deals in an area where we're already doing deals and we don't want to kind of compete with ourselves in that area. Maybe they don't have the experience, the track record that we look for in terms of exits, or they don't have the commitment to a particular area and market. They're just kind of doing deals randomly where they can get them. Um, that's not a good sign. So there's, there's a lot of reasons why one might disqualify a sponsor in, in working for them or say, Hey, you know, thank you for your interest, but it's not the right fit for us. It's not personal, you know, it's got nothing to do with that. Um, so I'd say it's, it's more of that than anything else. It, to me, I'm more than happy to not do a deal. I might regret whether that's, you know, in this space, whatever it is, I'd rather do no deal than do a deal that I feel might not be the right fit or I, I might, not that might regret doing in the future if that makes sense um so i'd like to feel good about what i'm doing in this space i have a lot of of patience remember that i mentioned earlier you know it took me a, a couple of years of consistently looking for a way to restructure my business to focus on doing it in, in the way that i had envisioned i can i can deal with waiting i don't I certainly don't mind that. I think that real estate generally is a long-term game and a long-term play. I'm not here to get as many fees as I can and do as many deals as I possibly can and, you know, buy a Lambo or anything like that. Um, I'm here to build wealth, build a sustainable business and continue to build for the future, you know, the future of myself and my family and certainly all the people that we do business with. So that's why I, I prefer to be really selective about who I do deals with, where I do deals with, and, you know, kind of who I associate with in the real estate space. Yeah. That patience is certainly a valuable characteristic to have in the real estate world, especially in the current environment that we're in and, and likely the environment <laughs> that we're going to be in for, you know, the next 12 to who knows how many months you, you, Taylor, you mentioned a little bit about your standards for who you do deals with and what types of deals um, that you do. Can you talk more about um, the the deal breakers, either deal wise or operator wise? What's a pretty you know pretty quick no for you, and what does get your attention if if an operator wants to attract someone? Uh, like you or you, um, what's going to get their attention in terms of being an operator or, or the deal? That's an interesting question. So there are quite a, quite a lot of deal breakers, but um, I would say I like to see folks being serious about the markets that they're investing in. If they're focused on a particular city or, or a couple of cities, rather than just bouncing around and kind of doing deals wherever they can, that's certainly important focus on a particular business model. Uh, to me, somebody that's, or a company that's doing a huge variety of, of different deals. Um, they're jack of all trades, master of none. I'd rather have the the master of one trade personally. So that's something I would look for. 
reputation certainly very important. That can be difficult to vet from publicly available information, but that is the benefit of networking, having conversations like you and I are having now slash will have unrecorded or conversations that we had at say the best ever conference, asking around about people. Oftentimes you folks might not know positive or negative. Maybe I've never done a deal with that person. But if you ask around, somebody might know somebody that has information about a company or a person, positive or negative. I'm not looking for just negative information. Just give me what I can find out um, privately. Let's see. What are some other things? I, you know, personally, I, in years past, did C-class apartment deals, especially pre-pandemic. I don't want to do C-class deals anymore. They're properties are older. They take a lot more capital expenditure to, you know, improve. There's generally less upside and post pandemic, especially the pandemic appreciation. They're pretty expensive, the C-class properties. So I don't like doing C-class deals. Um, you know, a lot of things along those lines. I, I, it's hard to say one specific red flag that like, nope, that's it. There is a bit of a gut feeling that's involved. The numbers are always, of course, very relevant, but it's a, it's a culmination of different factors that play in. How well does somebody communicate? Well, it's difficult to quantify how well somebody communicates, whether it's uh, from a thoroughness or frequency standpoint, but you kind of know whether this person's communicating with me as much as I expect or not. Do they respond to my emails? Do they give prompt updates? I mean, those are all things, uh, check boxes that I think we should all have in our own minds when we're thinking about doing a deal with someone, no matter what role they might play or we might play. You know, there's all those expectations that we have that I think we should be aware of. And that's just kind of a sampling of things that I think about. Taylor, can you give me your three best tips for raising capital right now? Dig the well before you're thirsty. Build relationships with investors way before you have a deal so that when you have a deal, you're less likely to scramble for you know investment capital. Keep a pulse on the market so you can see what's going on. What are other deals that folks are trying to do or, or are doing or heck, folks that are struggling, right? You can get a feel for what's going on by just asking others uh, what's happening in the market today and take your time, right? Investors, smart people who have maybe a couple million dollars to invest in real estate deals, they're smart, right? They built up that capital through their own labor. Maybe they're doctors, lawyers, or just savvy investors. They can see through the tricks that folks are playing. You know, bear in mind your integrity when you're thinking about doing a deal or communicating with people generally. It's all focused to me on the long game. And the more we keep that in mind, I think the better decisions that we make in terms of planning our businesses and building relationships with people. I want to zoom in on your first strategy. You said dig the well before you're thirsty and build relationships with potential passive investors. Um, what are your strategies for building relationships with high network individuals who could potentially become limited partners? So my podcast is a key aspect of starting that relationship with my investors today. About Right about two thirds of my investors today who have invested with me originally connected with me through listening to my podcast. So that kind of gets it started, right? We get on a call, we have several calls over time, get to know each other. So building that relationship like this way before we have a deal, or sometimes folks are talking to me and they're saying, I'm thinking about investing in a syndication next year. Maybe it's January and they're talking to me about the following year. Great. I don't discount that person from the person who says, I'm ready to move forward within the next couple of months. Those are still important relationships in the space. How can I help you learn about this business, whether it's from my experience? Can I provide resources that can help educate you? And not in a, a slanted or biased manner, but in an objective sense, because from my perspective and my experience is you want people in your deals that are that really understand what's going on. I've seen folks raise capital from investors who didn't understand what they were getting into or 
regretted their investment and you'd much you're you're going to regret having someone in your deal that didn't know what they were getting into or wasn't prepared for it much more than you will regret not having that capital in place if that makes sense yeah it really does Taylor, you talked about your podcast. Um, I want to spend a few minutes talking about your podcast. Um, I'm a fan of your podcast. It's become one of my go-to commercial real estate investing podcasts. You have fantastic guests. Um, you, uh, as listeners now experienced, you have a great voice for podcasts. Thank you. And um, honestly, I just think your podcast runs really smooth and you've got great content. Um, so I want to give you an opportunity talk about your podcast a little bit, plug it and tell me about, you know, how it's contributing to building your business. Yeah. Thank you so much. And thank you for listening. So my podcast is the passive wealth strategy show. We teach folks how to build wealth on main street and escape wall street, you know, how to build wealth with real estate. And we talk a lot about different types of real estate investing. We don't just talk about syndication or multifamily syndication. My goal from the jump was to have a podcast that was a little more objective. It wasn't so like sales heavy. I think a lot of folks out there, I don't mean to look down or, or speak about anybody, but I didn't want to have another show that was just how great multifamily syndication is and really just kind of a, a sales piece for you know my business that you know a lot of folks have out there. Now we do, as you know, we say, hey, I say, here's how to get in touch with me if you're interested, but it's not a pitch fest for me or my business. It's just connecting and providing education. So that was very important to me. Um, it's been, it's been great for my business development, my, my personal development. I found, or, you know, able to build my network and I found the opportunity that I, you know, currently have today from the capital raising side through an interview that I had on my podcast. And it wasn't necessarily intentional from, the get go of, I want to get this person on my show to learn about their business so I can go down that path. It was record a podcast, hit stop, and let's just chat for a little while, learn about it. And, oh, this guy's doing that thing that I want to do. How can I learn more about that? Because the guy's so great. He, you know, helped me go down the path. And here we are today. So getting started for me, I had a vision of putting knowledge out there, continuing to grow, getting more comfortable doing this public speaking thing, building my network, but I didn't necessarily know that it was going to grow to what it has grown to today. Um, you know, when somebody like, like you, you say, listen to my podcast, I, it's great. I love it. I, I don't, I mean, I know there are people out there listening. I don't expect anybody to listen, but I had a couple people come up to me at the best ever conference this year and say, Hey, I listen to your podcast. I recognize you. And I'd like, that made my week. That's, that's made my year. It's six months later now. And I'm still so excited about this, you know, these people having recognized me and, and come and said, hi, it's amazing. So yes, it's a, it's a ton of fun. It is a lot of work in terms of learning how to grow my team, grow my systems and get it to the point where it's not uh, a big it's not a huge time waster. It's, and I don't want to say waster. It's not a huge time commitment for me because we have a team in place that handles that back end production and, and getting things out there. Um, and we were talking a bit before we started recording the show. Well, Joe Fairless, a mutual connection of ours, the founder of uh, the best ever conference and so many other things. Uh, he's been a mentor of mine for years and he's pushing me to go from three episodes a week to five episodes a week. And that is a challenge, big challenge, but it's not something that I can even think is impossible. It's obviously not. Joe's been doing it seven days a week for, I don't know, almost eight, 10 years, eight years, I think eight yeah. years, incredible. <clears throat> so I, I can't say to this man that I can't do it. That's just not valid. But the challenge is how do I re-envision or redesign my team, my processes and my system so that we can release that number of episodes, but not only that, so that it can be better than it is today and be less work or less hassle 
for me. And I have all of those ideas. I'm working on all of those things. Um, and it's very exciting to me. I think the key is to keep in mind the possibilities and why I'm doing all of these things, why I'm going to this trouble. It's, it's to grow my business, to grow myself and, you know, to grow our wealth all together and to get out there in front of more people. There are always setbacks that come along the way. I had a pretty big quote unquote setback, a, a surprise, if you will, that came to me this week on Monday or Tuesday. And it set me for a spin a little bit. It got me thinking kind of the rest of the night, man, I don't know if I can do this five days a week. And it, you know, I had a hard time that evening, but went to bed, woke up the next morning. And I was like, I do not accept that. I can't do this. Joe did it. I know a lot of other people have done Whitney, another great guy who's, who's done this. So keeping that goal in mind and building teams and systems that can run it for me and take me out of the equation as much as reasonably possible is very important. But on the other side of that, I need to build those teams and systems and still remember the responsibility of putting out a quality show so that I can delegate rather than abdicate the responsibility. Taylor, as a once a week podcaster, that is super inspiring to me. Um, I know you can do it. I, I know you've got it. I see the quality of your current podcast. And so um, the idea of, um, I love what you said about increasing the output of going to five times per week, but decreasing the amount of commitment and responsibility that you have and while also increasing the, the quality of the podcast. Um, it reminds me of the book. I, I assume that you've read it, but a, a new book uh, that I read a month or two ago, 10X is easier than 2X. 100%. So, it's, yep. so it's that exact idea of, of having 10X the output or doing, you know, huge things, but it actually being easier and less work for you. And so, um, it's not easy to get to that point, but, but that's the concept. And I know so much of it has to do with systems and you are so much better at systems than I am. You've been talking a lot about systems recently on your podcast. Can you talk a little bit about, uh, maybe some specific systems that you've been able to implement that have had a huge impact on your business. Yeah, absolutely. And I talk about them on the show because it's on my mind right now, big time. So that's what I want to talk about on the show. Um, so I can help flesh the thought out in my head and also share what I've learned. So systems are great, but they're just another job unless you have a team to operate them. So a system to me is, a repeatable process that kind of basically acts like a checklist that you can turn a podcast or a thought leadership platform or really anything into a step-by-step -step process. And by writing it down and saying, this is what my next step is, the thing I need to get done, and then have like a guide how to do it or something like that, that can be operated by someone. That's a step one, whatever your thing is that you need to get done turn it into a recipe thinking of, think about it like baking or, or cooking or something, turn it into a recipe that you can follow. But then the key is to find someone or some ones who can operate that system for you and you can watch over them, make sure they're getting it done, help them as needed, clarify, or, you know, unfortunately sometimes let folks go and replace them. That's not something I want to do. And that's through, you know, hiring the right person in the first place. So for me, hiring virtual assistants has been so important. And that's something that I failed miserably at for, I mean, I, for years, a bunch of people that I hired that I failed them. They didn't fail me. They didn't fail me. I failed them. I didn't set them up right. I didn't set proper expectations. I didn't understand what they needed to be one invested in the opportunity that I wanted to offer them a, a job or set them up for success in the role. So part of that is giving, paying them enough. I mean, that's, that's number one, right? These folks need uh, to support their families on the job. That's number one. So I started paying them more. That was number one. 
Number two was very clearly communicating that to them, my expectations, course correcting along the way when they would make a mistake. And then a big thing with virtual assistants is I learned this through, through a course that I took on hiring virtual assistants. You need to make sure that they understand and agree ahead of time that they're not allowed to disappear. They agree that if they have a question, you are not allowed to disappear. You have to ask me and I will answer it and I will not get upset with you having a question. That's my side of the, of the agreement is that when you ask me a question, I will not be upset with you. I will not be offended. I will be happy that you asked me a question and we will work through the problem together and I will clarify it. We will improve the system. Previously, I hadn't built adequate systems. I didn't communicate frequently enough with them and I just, I, I don't think I necessarily understood their perspective well enough. And I think it starts with having the right mental model. When people talk about virtual assistants in any business, the first place, the first thing that kind of we all want to say about virtual assistants in our business is I use virtual assistants in my business, right? If you look out there about hiring virtual assistants, you're mostly going to find using quote unquote virtual assistants. Well, that is the wrong mental model. We're hiring people who are people with their own goals, dreams, and ambitions to work in our business. And to me, having that, that mental switch and really applying that in every way when I hire someone helps put me on the right track. It sounds like a small thing, but it's huge. I want to find the right person who wants to be here, who wants to work, who wants to do this activity and who, who wants to stick around. Right. But I'm still, you know, hiring a person to do that. And that's, that's so important. I, in hindsight, can't believe that I needed somebody to highlight that to me. It's so obvious now that I know it, but I did. And now I try to share that with others. I, I think that last point you made is really powerful. I think so often in American circles, um, VAs, someone has a problem. Oh, just get a VA. Just go to this website, go to that website, get a VA. And they're almost treated like commodities, like just something you sign up for. Mm -hmm. And all of your, all of your problems will be solved if you just sign up for this service. Uh, but, um, you know, I wrote down in my notes that, uh, we're hiring people. It's not just, you know, you're not just checking this box or, um, signing up for the service. It's a real person with dreams and hopes and ambitions and a family and um, things that they want to achieve in their life. So um, I think that's a great spot to end it, Taylor. Um, last question. If uh, listeners want to connect with you, learn more about you, where would you like to send people? Check out my podcast, the Passive Wealth Strategy Show. Uh, every Monday, Tuesday, Thursday now, but soon to be every weekday. I'm scared and excited about that change. Or if you'd like to learn about doing deals with us or just have a conversation with me, go to investwithtaylor.com. Perfect. Taylor, um, I sincerely appreciate your time um, sharing your expertise and your wisdom, um, what's working in your business and, and how you're raising capital legally. This has been an awesome conversation. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me. Listeners, if you enjoyed this conversation, please reach out to either one of us. We love talking about commercial real estate, and we would love to hear from you and connect with you. Thank you so much for listening. Until next time, take care.